Well, my friend, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Uh, we're excited. So much of the conversations we've had with other partners tends to be really focused on technology, which is fantastic. But the view that yourself and Aaron and Jamal have from a customer perspective is, is certainly very enlightening for us. And so with that, why don't we start with an introduction of, of yourself and, and the team and then jump into some of, some of the things that Avanade's doing. And then we have some questions we'd love to just jump into. That sounds good. That okay. sounds good. And thank, thank you for having me. Uh, and having us today, and um, I think this is about the third time we've done this. Maybe the third. fourth, third, third. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I always enjoy doing this, so it's uh, it's always a vibrant and energizing uh, discussion. So I am Craig Gorsline, uh, like Jim. I'm also a uh, former Canadian. Let's put it that way. Um, who uh, gave up his uh, allegiance to the North? Geez, I guess I've been in the U.S. now 20 years, so that wow. seems like a long, long time. But um, I uh, am the chief growth officer for Avanade. So uh, what does that mean? That means I have overall responsibility for our entire go-to-market um, frameworks and solutions, systems. I, we have, uh, we're organized very much like Microsoft in that we have core solution areas around application infrastructure and data and AI and business applications, those all roll up into me as well as our business consulting or advisory business, as well as emerging technology, which Sharon leads, um, and um, as and our ventures program, which uh, Jamal leads. Um, and I've been at Avanade now going on, uh, I think I just clicked over three years. Uh, and before that, I've been in tech consulting and uh, uh, for 30 years, almost 30 years, and uh, spent the previous, before Avanade, spent 15 years at a high-end digital engineering company called uh, ThoughtWorks, um, where I was in many, many different roles the last five as CEO. So uh, that's a little bit about me. I live in Nashville and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Uh, Aaron, maybe you want to introduce yourself and then Jamal? Yeah, so as Craig said, Aaron Reich, I'm actually in Seattle. Uh, I've been with Avanade for nine years, and right now I run emerging technology and, and ventures. So that's our, you know, applied R&D function of how we combine, you know, what we see coming new on the technology and business side, you know, together with ecosystem, which which, which is, you know, I know Jamal and I have met with, with many of you already, um, and we've got more to do, uh, and then how we bring that to clients as fast as possible. And I'm Jamal Pope. I'm based in Atlanta. I've been with Avanade for four months and work focused on ventures, as Aaron mentioned. And Jim, would it help to do a kind of a 30 second or one minute overview of Avanade? Yeah, level please. Set? yeah. So some of you may know Avanade, many of you may not. We are a 21 year um, technology and system integration firm. We are a joint venture founded by uh, two very large parents, Accenture and Microsoft. And um, I would argue that, you know, uh, that we are hands down uh, the most successful and probably the longest running joint venture that exists, I think, in the tech space. Uh, it's rare to see a 21 year um, uh, JV still in operation. Uh, we, um, we are very focused as a firm on one thing and one thing only. Although within that one thing, there's lots of things we cover, but in that one thing, and it's Microsoft. Um, and unlike many other SI firms who you'll find, like our parent Accenture, they'll have an Amazon or an AWS practice. They have an SAP practice. They have Oracle and Microsoft and all the, we have one thing and one thing only, and that's Microsoft. And as it comes to Microsoft, our charter is really to bring the power of the Microsoft platform uh, to the enterprise. And that enterprise um, target space for us is really two two components. We go to market with Accenture on what we call or they call, Microsoft calls the S500, which is their strategic 500. So think the largest 500 um, companies that are out there, the JP Morgans of the world and what have you. We go to market with Accenture in that space, bringing Microsoft platform and tools to life. And then we have a very distinct channel where um, we go to market alone, um, where we are very focused on what we think of as being the sub-global 2000, the mid-market, if you will. And those, that's not, those aren't small companies. Uh, those are, you know, billion dollar plus, and many of them, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 billion dollar companies. 
Um, but we're very focused on that market when we go from a direct perspective. Um, and when it comes to, you know, the offerings and what we bring to market, effectively, it rain, you know, it's the entire suite of offerings, everything from custom software engineering, data and AI services, the analytics components, where the one of the largest biz apps, uh, business applications as in ERP and CRM uh, implementers and, and providers in the world. And so we we really span that entire set of services, but it's only really on that one domain. And so far, you know, we'll end this year about through three and a half billion, hopefully a little higher than that in terms of size and 43,000 people as of last month worldwide. So that's uh, that's a little bit about us. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. So um, as you rightly pointed out, we've had three sessions with you. The first was spring of last year. The second was fall of last year. And now this. If we remember, the spring of last year was was really the early onset of, of COVID yeah. and the impacts that it created. And if I were to paraphrase what you were suggesting, that was like a sort of a deer in the headlights for your customers, right? It, COVID had sort of come, many cases, not as prepared for it. But when we talked to you in the fall of last year, I think the, the, the comment you made that really stuck with me is that, that your customers were taking it as an opportunity to build some resiliency. I'm, I'm eager to learn now where we're at in the spring of this year, what's changed, if anything? Because um, I think that's a great starting point for our conversation today for folks to kind of learn what's really changing and how much of the change that has happened do you think is permanent, both in the way we work and the increased dependency on technology and automation and data and all the other fun stuff. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, it's it's what a man, what a ride the last 13 months or so or 14 months, depending on, you know, what I guess we're in April. So 13 months, what a ride it's been since, um, you know, kind of the borders closed and the world changed in March yeah. of last year. I mean, when when we look back and we think about what happened early on um, in terms of client response and and how our customers really dealt with. The crisis, and it really was a crisis, a crisis that, you know, I would argue the world has never seen before uh, at, at the scale and um, in, in modern times. I mean, the last time there was something of this size and impact, um, if you put aside the world wars, was the Spanish flu, and the world is a very different place than it was in 1918. Um, our economies are different. Technology is everywhere. The way we live our lives is very different. So it really was a crisis period. And I would say that during that first March, March, April, May time frame, our, now that we look back on it, our customers kind of had this opportunity of, of going one of two ways. They could either pray, hope, and you know, and wait for the next sunrise, as in just keep the lights on. And there were a large component of customers that did that, yeah. um, that we saw. The other customer base were those customers who, after they got through the initial shock of March and April, and by the time we came to May, June, July, they were they were going, you know what, our business is down, we're, we've been hit, we got it. We're going to actually use this as an opportunity to to really be the, the the company that we've always aspired to be. And those customers, and there are more and more of them that have now come along into that camp, um, have really taken the opportunity over the last 12 months to shed themselves of a lot of debt. And I don't mean monetary debt. I mean technical debt people debt, process debt, um, uh, legislative or compliance debt, right? All of the things that build up over time as you're building big organizations and organizations happen. And, and then, you know, uh, the best story I like to tell is, you know, going into the pandemic, most of our clients, you know, I go visit clients around the world and they we're all on the path to being digital. We've been well on the way of being digital, Craig. It's great. Okay, tell me about what you're you're doing. And then they'd roll out their, their big program of change and it would be, you know, tens, twenties, thirties, maybe hundreds of individual programs that they had going on around be this pursuit of becoming digital. And that all came to a screeching halt in many respects when the pandemic hit. And the supply chain and the demand side of the, you know, both sides of the ledger got shook. And our clients got, you know, went through a period of 
again, there was this crisis period. And then there was really, what are we, okay, this isn't going away. <laughs> this isn't some short, this isn't the two-week thing that we thought it might be when it first started. We're going to have to figure out how to survive. We're going to have to figure out how to how keep doing what we're doing, and most importantly, figure out ways to renew during the, working within the, the, the constraints of um, the pandemic. And, you know, as I look back and I think about the clients that have been, our clients that have been able to do that, to really get clear, suddenly those hundreds of programs of work are now starting to land in a very clear set of areas of investment. Um, and, you know, there's a number of themes that if I were now to look back over the 13 months and kind of group for our clients in terms of where they're placing focus and energy, one is around um, resilience. And this is a this is probably the in my opinion, this is the number one theme of any CEO today is how do I build better resilience into my, the core of my business? Why is that a number one theme? Because we should not underestimate just how fragile most companies were going into the pandemic. You know, companies can, enterprise can tell that they're in the cloud and what have you, and that's all great. But I can, for every story of how a company um, withstood the pandemic and 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 uh, and survived because of their resilience. I can tell you five stories of companies that either went out of business or just about went out of business because they didn't have the core operations set up the right way. They were maybe hybrid in terms of half in and half off the cloud. Perhaps they weren't even in the cloud. The the resilience factor is a very very important theme. How do I build? that elasticity and that responsiveness and that enterprise agility into the core of who we are so that not only technologically but from a human standpoint and from a client service standpoint we have a lot we can withstand another beating in a much different and better way that's one theme i think the other big theme that has emerged over the last uh 13 months which should be no surprise to anybody in this call virtual is the new reality man and, um, you know, it's been interesting to read and see all the, are we ever going back to work? Our office is going away, um, all of those things. And I think now that we're a year into this, the reality is no offices are not going away. We're human species and we crave connection, but we will not return to that state of, you know, 10 million people transiting or commuting into Manhattan every day. That is just not going to happen at the same scale. We're going to, we're going to find ourselves in hybrid um, circumstances, and I think that is that is going to be one of the most interesting points of innovation that will come out of this. If you look, if you go back and look at every Black Swan event from the start of time, any Black Swan crisis and event has been followed by a period of massive innovation. And we're, we're going to have that same, uh, we're already seeing it, to be honest, but we're going to see it over the next couple of years in terms of how systems are changed, how do we evolve, the lessons we've learned, and the way we do work and the, this whole concept of virtual um, is really going to not, not disappear. It is here. And, um, and, and that is forcing organizations to have to wrestle with some pretty big challenges. Yeah. What do I do with my my capital cost? What do I do with my infrastructure? What do I do with real estate? How do I build virtual teams? How do I build teams that are half together, half distant? How do I build teams and culture where people show up a couple days a week in the office because they have things to do, but then go back to their virtual world? Uh, that whole dynamic. And you can say, well, we've been in this journey for a long time, not Yes, we have, but not at the pace or scale that we've been through over the last 12 to 13 months. Um, <clears throat> your your so. point on resiliency rings true. Just last week, um, thanks to our colleague Shelly from VMware, we had a chance to invite Steve, or sorry, Jeff Wiles, who is the one of Starbucks' CIO over, overlooking retail, yeah. among other things. And 
they had been investing in their mobile experience long before the pandemic happened. It was just one of those waves that they said, hey, this is kind of where our customer experience is going. We need to invest. And then all of a sudden at March, that fateful March 19th or whatever, and things really started to shut down for them, they're just throwing more instances behind the mobile experience. You know, they had their retail experience couldn't, couldn't be the same it was because stores were shutting down. But for those customers who were turning to mobile to engage with Starbucks, they just added more. So I guess that's a great example of a company that was baking resiliency into, you know, into how they operate and how they delight their customers. Yeah. They, they would be the company that, first off, Starbucks was already ahead of the curve in terms of how they viewed digital and digital experience. But they certainly never went into, we're just going to make it till tomorrow's sunrise. From yeah. the get-go, they were very much about, let we're going we're gonna to redefine, reinvent, re-innovate, and change our operating model to keep delivering service. And I think, you know, it's interesting, I, I, it would be interesting uh, to, um, to understand their perspective on this. The third big trend we've seen now that you look at 12 to 13 months in is what I call the complete revamp of the last mile. And I don't mean the last mile of code delivery. I mean the last mile of service and product delivery. Mm. And Starbucks is one of them. They've had to reinvent their last mile. How do they get product? To customer, you look at the whole QSR, the quick service industry, right? The whole suddenly order online, pick up at the curb, curb pick up, all of this. It was all real clunky to begin with, and now the big brands have it down to a science. They've got it linked with mobile apps. They've got it linked to you know arrive and pay, and and that trend of reinventing the last mile. Every single industry we did, we've done work. We do a lot of work in healthcare um, and doctors doing rounds. Um, that became a high risk activity uh, mm -hmm. during COVID. And we were able to work with a number of hospitals to be able to rethink what the concept of rounds and building a virtual rounding uh, type of approach. And that's a redefinition of the last mile of healthcare delivery. When yep. you're in hospital and you see the doctor every day, every single industry has gone through that and continues to go through the reshaping and the rethinking of their service delivery mechanism of how they get product and service to customer. Interesting. So uh, Avanade has, uh, as you've rightly explained, you know, built this long legacy, 20 plus one years of, of service to, to customers of, of really all sizes. And in many respects, you're, you're seen as a trusted advisor uh, to, yeah. to whoever's making the business decision. And that I, I imagine has changed, Craig, even from the days of the classic CIO to now the new line of business owner that is making IT like decisions, right? For 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 their business, um, I in in that shedding of baggage. When you said that earlier, that really prompted this question, which is, how have your customers evaluated technology pre-COVID versus post-COVID? Because I think it's changed, right? In that shedding of baggage, they're reprioritizing a lot of things. And so, what advice would you give to our startups in terms of how to approach with the value they've created? this new enterprise mindset around resiliency, the mobility of work, and just how they're evaluating what new technologies they may want to onboard into their IT functions yeah, in those cases. That's a great question, actually, because it has changed a lot in the last 12 to 13 months. I would, um, I would start by driving home the point, uh, something you said earlier, right? When, when Avanade started back in 2000, you know, we built... We were good to go, right? We, we knew tech inside and out, and we could go and talk to any tech buyer inside of an enterprise like it was no tomorrow, right? We'll talk programming language. We'll talk architecture. We'll talk reference architecture. We'll talk, you know, all of the plumbing and the inner workings of all the secret sauce that developers and techies love to talk about. But the reality has been in the last four to five years, there's been a massive shifting Starting about 2014, 15 in the market, where organizations have really changed the way they look at technology. And it's no longer just the CIO's organization or the CTO's organization who makes these decisions. Um, the, you know, the shifting that occurred, and many of you will, will recall the great debate around the line between business and IT and is the line blurring and all that. No, there is no line anymore. That's the bottom line. Um, and you have CEOs now who, well, first off, there's been a number of reasons why there's been this shifting. First off, if you, you have a different demographic 
and you have a different type of leader who is now filling the CEO, CIO, CTO, CHRO role. These are more and more digital natives. Perhaps they're digital immigrants, but they are very tech savvy. They get the concept of tech. They understand it. This is not the 80s when you go in and sell to the line of business and it was just kind of went right over their head. The enterprise business buyer today is very well educated and generally knows, uh, very plugged in and generally knows where technology can make some big moves to their needle, to their move in their progress. The last 12 months, I think there are three things that the startups here need to understand about the enterprise buyer. Number one, there is no room for bullshit. Pardon my French. It is straight talk, no nonsense. What is it that's going to help me achieve the goals of building resilience, dealing with this virtual hybrid world, reimagining products and services, and capturing aggressive new market share in a world that is not the same as it was a year ago in terms of power. So clarity of discussion, clarity of how solutions will move the needle are absolutely more than ever a very important part of working with the enterprise buyer. The second most important um, thing that I believe uh, in selling to the enterprise today is understanding, having enough of the understanding of the domain that the client exists in. Uh, I call it domain because industry is a little bit too uh, constraining for me, but more than ever, if we are going in to talk to uh, a retail executive about how AI can help power their store operations, you need to understand the supply chain buying procurement cycles of retail. They are not going to educate you. Hard stop. They don't have, and the pandemic has really brought that, um, brought that home. So the combination of no nonsense, get down and be as clear as possible around how solutions can help move the needle, under and then dr- bringing those solutions to life with the industry domain are absolutes. There is one third uh, thing that I would leave you with on this on this topic, and that is um, the absolute appetite that exists in market today for new thinking and innovation. I think, you know, the, the, the leaders in the enterprise would always pre-pandemic be open to new ideas and new thinking and vendors coming with pitching new stuff. They would always be there. They'd take the best of it and Everybody now accepts that we are together going to travel through history, through a period of time where there remain some very big unknowns. And as vendors or partners to the enterprise, us going forward and really having innovative new thinking, new ways of Um, advancing and building capability, it is more than ever, the appetite is there in the enterprise to entertain new thinking. But it's got to be in a no-nonsense way. It's got to be real. And it's got to be, it can't be vaporware. And it's got to be delivered in the context of the company's industry. That's a great point, Craig. And you touched on two industries that um, arguably were kind of shook and uh, a little bit by the COVID pandemic. Uh, healthcare and retail were too, but of across the world, where you know you've had a chance to kind of surveil and and assess kind of which industries are really leaning into digital transformation. Let's say now more than ever, those sound like two of maybe the top five. But what industries would you point out to our teams are the ones who are like absolutely all in on this? And and to your point, no no bullshit, no nonsense. This is sort of core to their you know new capabilities and differentiation. What industries are really leaning in? Yeah, I, and I think some of this is COVID pandemic related. Yeah. Some of it is because we've just gone through this period yeah. of a pandemic, but it's not directly tied to a pandemic. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Sure. Um, 
look, you know, when you look at <clears throat> industries that fully have their arms around the power of technical innovation as they reinvent, healthcare is number one. If 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 you are playing in a healthcare type environment and space with a healthcare line or product, um, you know the next in my mind the next three to five years are instrumental for you in capturing whatever market share it is that your product or service addresses. Healthcare is really going to see a massive leap forward, whether it be electronical medical records, whether it be pharma certainly life science um and um and i think you we are seeing early signs not early signs well established signs and signals that the funding that is being that's going into healthcare uh around digital transformation is significant so that's one believe it or not the second industry isn't an industry at all public sector right and I guess you could call that an industry if you're looking at, but it, it, it's we call it citizen services. We look at it through a lens of the services that get delivered to constituents by your federal, state, and local. And this is something that we all share. All how how many people live on this planet? I don't know. Oh. Seven, seven, yeah. five billion. So, no, I think it's closer to nine billion. But I'll, I'll ask Google billion. later. Yeah, all nine billion of us have it had this same experience over the last 13 months which is that our public sector entities whether you were in china whether you were in chicago or whether you were in london were challenged to deliver core basic services of our society and they are going through um transformation um on the back of that and i will tell you the biggest challenge that public sector has is how do they pay for it all it's no shortage of ideas from how do you redefine um, case management to how do you redefine um, delivery of outsourced uh, um, point of contacts uh, and citizen support services all the way through to how do you think about, um, you know, the, the basics of delivery of, of city services and, and smart city integration. There is no shortage uh, of ideas and product and solution out there, public sector is having to wrestle with how do they pay for it. Um, and if you're in the U.S., you're going to hear some of that come from our president tonight during his state his joint address. And you've already seen that when you start to look at the U.S. This is just a U.S. view. U.S. federal government around infrastructure spend. You know, infrastructure. Many people attribute that to oh, okay, so we're going to repair roads and bridges. Yes, we are going to do that. But if you dig deep into their infrastructure plans, 5G is at the core of that, bringing, you know, high speed telecommunication hookups to a level we've never seen. And I think that whole space is one that's going through massive disruption. I'll just leave you with the third industry. Um, and that, um, that very much is uh, energy. And this is a this is an industry that I wouldn't say is being driven through driven to disruption because of the pandemic. Um, it's it's seizing the opportunity um, of the pandemic when patterns of commute, patterns of travel really changed. Mm -hmm. They're seizing the opportunity to sink a clean and green agenda like you've never seen. So, you know, oil prices tank, fine, all those things. But it's not about, yes, it, and by the way, oil will come back up and everything will be fine and every, all of that. But the most progressive energy companies have used the time and space of the pandemic to really solidify their green agenda and their clean tech um, approach and what that's going to look like. And um, and we're, st we're starting to see a lot of that uh, come to life in active discussions with clients. Um, so those are the, those are the three that I would. Yeah. Thank you. On the energy side, that's interesting. I, I, I thought your third would have been manufacturing because we see a lot of, you know, a lot of the news about manufacturers who do the pandemic and other means just really, really, really weren't able to, you know, continue their processes. They either ran out of components or they couldn't get people in or what have you. And so there was a big push that I've read about in manufacturing. Do you see something similar? 
Yeah, I mean, Aaron, you might want to jump in here. I, it would be a close follower. You okay. could switch out energy for manufacturing. I mean, the reality is, look, the reason that everybody was so shocked uh, and went into crisis mode last March is because our supply chains fell apart, quite frankly. Yes, there was the local individual health concerns, but the yep. big shock to the economy was closed borders, linear supply chains that were hard locked, sole sourcing, all of those things have been put to the test, right? And now... Right the 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 mantra the you know if i was sitting as a ceo of a manufacturing company i want distributed supply chains i want virtual supply chains i want full redundancy in my supply chains right. i want to be able to have fail safe cutovers on a moment's notice and right. that's the that's tying back to resilience aaron you spent a lot of time with our iot groups and and doing that type of thing what, what are you seeing in manufacturing yeah i would just say the main thing from the manufacturing side is I think they had a digital transformation journey that they were on and it was just accelerated because you've got a lot of manufacturing plants that have a lot of high tech in them, but that doesn't mean that they're all scaled and that they're all connected, right? They still yeah. are very distributed in the way that they work and they're very individualized, you know, either in regions or pockets of the world. And there was plans to sort of, you know, we'll eventually get there and light those up. But I think you know, Craig had spoke about the speed that we saw sort of right after COVID of how fast clients want to move from a digital transformation perspective. And I think within manufacturing, we're beginning to see that happen now, which is, you know, yeah, we had supply chain disruptions, but our ability to operate, you know, either remotely or to have a modern way to connect and actually know what all the different plants are doing, you know, the, the, the data around that and the way that they operated was, was not in place. Um, yep. and, and we're seeing a very fast forward in, you know, how all of that comes to life. Yep. Well, one of the, one of the fallouts of that, that we're still experiencing is the chip shortage and it's impacting many right. industries, totally. right? Not just devices, but vehicles yep. and, and other things. I think it's as safe to say and argue that supply chain was running on such thin, just in time uh, principles that there was no room for error. Not to this scale. I mean, uh, no. and it's it's created some impact. Cool. I have a lot of other questions I want to raise. Kevin Bandy from Symmetric just raised his hand, so I'll turn to him. I'd like to actually get back to you, though, um, Craig, on private networks. Because mm. just like our COVID conversation from spring of last year to fall of last year to now, a lot of material you know, changes in discourse have been really happening around private networks. And I'd love to chat with you about that. But Kevin, please go ahead and, and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, sure. Hey, Craig, I wanted to pick up on something that you said and then clarify something as well. As in, my, in my words, you clarified something that I've, I've said to many of boards and leaders as well as digitization is not automation. It is the evolution of business models. That's and right. So, and that is where the second point that you made subtly is the interest in IT is not within the CIO anymore. And trends that I was seeing before I stepped into Symmetric is boards are more inclined to want to understand technology, even though CIOs are responsible for executing it. The CFO and the CEOs and the COOs want to understand the implications and the timing of the decisions around the technology more so than ever. And so you said this, and I just want to see if A, you agree with that. And then two, when they're looking at the timing, they want the predictable outcomes of the investments. They're not just looking at the automation. They want the investment outcome associated with the technical decisions because it is paramount to how they're going to run their business in a sustainable manner. Yes, I would agree. I would agree with everything that you just said. Um, let me just build on the the board point. You know, one of the one of the uh, capability, uh, well, one of the offerings we have is um, working with MIT. Uh, we have a relationship. We're a patron with MIT Scissor, which is their center for internet systems research. And one of the things that we do is uh, with our advisory business is help our clients do an assessment around boards. Uh, their savviness, tech savviness of their boards, and helping um, boards understand themselves actually around how just how digitally savvy are they, and um, and that's always an interesting experience. We did it with Continental, which is a huge uh, tire manufacturer, for lack of a better word, out of Germany, and um, and it was very enlightening to see the chairperson of the board, you know, just kind of take his 
take his uh, fellow board members to task just around how illiterate they were and how unappreciating they were on the complexities of what it means to lead a digital organization today. So I do think that's one example. I do think that boards just like C-suites are becoming much more digitally savvy and Mm -hmm. want and are demanding the business case justification to your point of when is the realization of the return going to happen and what is the line of sight to that? Um, I'll just share the, an example that, um, you know, I had, this was pre-pandemic and I was out for dinner with a CIO and and um, I think it was the chief digital officer from one of our clients. And we were talking about AI and we were talking about embedding of AI into their organization. And, you know, <laughs> He put his fork and knife down and he said, you know, Craig, the last thing I need, I don't need any more bots. I got so much AI, I don't know what to do with it. When am I going to see the damn intelligence actually pay returns? And that is really an underlying theme around the appetite of the enterprise buyer today. I think you're spot on, Kevin, in terms of being able to articulate not only the path to you know the technical innovation and the automation and the efficiencies that come with that but the actual return in a yeah. business relevant way and i'll just i'll close with something else that you said and it's and it's something jim has heard me say as one i was with cisco the number of boards that were coming to us was exponentially we got up to like 13 boards a week were coming and the outcome that they were looking for was as you said the implication but you also said this as well as where do I have value trapped in my business today? And each of us need to do a better job of identifying where there is waste in existing operations that could be addressed and and then also streamlined to expedite those digital efforts. And that's where I think a lot of CFOs and CEOs and us is now starting new technologies and working with an Avanon have got to be more definitive in pointing out where there is value just fundamentally trapped. That's right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Craig, I'm I'm curious to get your perspective on on private 5G, private LD today for enterprises. There's this crazy raging debate, you know, about whether carriers should be involved in it or not. Um, The validity of the market, you know, is it a real thing or are people just kicking the tires and may not materialize to be anything? You know, too significant um, to you know to the simplicity of it. Because if you really think about it, if a if a enterprise is going down the path of here in the United States CBRS or something equivalent in other countries, really what they're doing is they're just upgrading Wi-Fi to something a lot more secure, a lot more fast, and so on and so forth. So, like many folks are also thinking, people are overthinking the whole private 5G network up market opportunity. I'm curious to know where we are today, given some of the other conversations we've had in the past, what you're seeing in the boardrooms and in customers that you're chatting with. Is this top of mind? And if it is top of mind, what are some of those signals that, that lead you to believe it either, you know, will materialize into something real or, or, or maybe not? Love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I, I'll kick off and then Aaron can jump in and and, um, and give his, his view. Look, I think much like cloud, when, you know, the push to cloud, there's going to be a natural desire to want to test and learn yep and i could readily see you know just like we had private cloud i could see private 5g networks um coming to life with within some of the largest organizations as organizations want to move at pace to bring 5g to life but they don't have the trust of the telco or they don't trust their provider can I ask Can I, a question? Why? Because Jeff brought something up as well. He didn't name any carriers, but he was just saying, look, we signed up for connectivity to some of our, I think it was 10,000 stores here in the United States. And we were telling our carriers when the line dropped or if there was a connectivity issue. Um, not not to insult anybody on the carrier side, I just love to know why that trust doesn't exist. What 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 is it that's brought them to that point? When you scale up and you get to the enterprise level, yeah. yeah, you know the working, especially in the U.S. This is not an easy. It is not an easy ecosystem to exist in 
with right. all of the different carriers, who endpoints, the handoff points, the switch yeah. points. Right. And my Lord, as a enterprise buyer who's trying to assemble to say, I need lightning speed and 99 you know, five nines, and I need redundancy, and I need all of these other things. And by the way, I'm redefining how we deliver service, and my business owners want more, 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 more. Having to exclusively work through that myriad of providers is a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of the same reasons. And there's also a degree, by the way, of just uncertainty as to what. 5g at scale by the way 6g that you know as next what does that actually mean and so i think inside the enterprise you're seeing a lot of reactions you're seeing kind of that how do we move at this pace with our providers by the way our providers are not necessary to your point our providers are not necessarily as current and up to speed and by the way our our provider isn't exactly helping push us. We're in many ways, and I'll suspect at Starbucks, they're pushing the provider uh, yeah. to build feature set. Um, yeah. And so there'll be this that reconciled with how do we build, test, and learn? And so that's where I think you'll see variations of private 5G, much like private cloud, came to rise. And then I would suspect over time you may see private 5G actually remain and be dedicated to the most mission critical services where the provide sorry where the enterprise wants to own the end to end and not have to go out and rely on uh, external providers that Got that's it. just my hypotho- hypothesis mm-hmm. we're not you know at scale we're not seeing i'm not seeing a lot of 5g conver- private 5g conversations yet so I'm I'm kind of putting myself inside the IT shop and the business shop and replaying all of the discussions that came when cloud with cloud. Do you go open? Do you go public? Do you do yep. private? Do we yep. build, test, learn? Do we yada yada yada? So, Aaron, what else to add to that? I'll build a little on what Craig said. I mean, I I'll go. Let's look at the signals to start. Right. So. From a signal perspective, you can see CBRS and what that's creating, you know, in, in, in the United States specifically, and where you've got enterprises buying spectrum, right? That didn't ha- like that happened a little bit. You've got telcos that are still doing it, but you've got, you know, the likes of John Deere, Chevron, others that are putting in significant dollars to, to buy it. And that then doesn't mean, you know, I forgot who I was talking to yesterday, but we we're having a conversation around. What if the, you know, on the golf side, the car caddy, like, you know, what if every, what, what if that company decided to buy Spectrum, right? But there's no one selecting oh. that thing. So, so there's a there's a spot where you're seeing that. Then in Europe, we're seeing um, with Bonza, and then I can't remember the one in the UK, right? Like we're seeing kind of the CBRS model move in, into different countries, which then I go all right, there's something that is actually happening there. Um, I think the cloud analogy that Craig has is the correct one, and I'll go one step further, and I think it's a um, it's it's a bit of command and control and what we're comfortable with and what we don't know yet, yep. right? And so in yep. the cloud world, it was, you know, I, even before public, private, or hybrid, it was, I ran a data center, I know what a data center is. I know how it works. I control it and I can do that better than an Amazon, a Google or, or, or a Microsoft. Yep. And what we started to be able to see was, well, there's a cost thing there that makes it a little bit better. I actually could have the control that I want. And so I think we're still in the beginning days of a lot of education on what needs to happen for what the potential for a private 5G network can actually bring. Um, And I think that there is, you know, runway at clients that want to begin to experiment, but you have to get over the, 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 you know, the complexity that sort of exists with, we already have a telco, we're working with them or lots of them, it is complicated. We spent a lot of money with our OT folks and our network engineers, and now there's ways to get around that. And do I wanna get around that? And do I feel comfortable doing that? And what does that also mean for the other contracts that I potentially have in place? And so 
you know, regardless of whatever new XG is coming next or, you know, some new Wi-Fi that's going to be there, I think now there's multiple tool belts or multiple tools that sort of sit in the belt that part of our job as, as you know, um, from the Avanade side is to work with you all and our clients and bring some of that education and say, mm-hmm. hey, you used to architect in this way. You do yeah. not need, there, there's now another way you could actually think about doing this. And that brings you know, X solution to market or cost out of because you don't need the network engineer anymore. You can kind of do it in, in this particular way. Uh, and I, I, I still think we are in the early days of this, but I see it moving very, very quickly. Um, and Craig and I are having conversations around what we need to do on that front. And at the same time, you know, like earlier today, you know, Jim, you know who he is, but Sean Peterson, who owns our you know, application infrastructure business on the Avanade side, he and I, again, we're talking about what is uh what do we need to be doing here because there is opportunity that is still on the table and how do we bring that education and help our clients kind of along the journey um because it is it it has to slip into the digital transformation journey that they're already on because what it can't happen is the ability for you know them to go through the journey they're on and then in three years go oh crap we forgot about what we could do on the network side yeah, and I, I think you both brought up a, a really interesting point. The paradigms are slightly different in terms of early days cloud to early days where we are today with connectivity. Let's just call it connectivity because that's really what it is. 5G just happens to be where we are today standards-wise. But I don't see the signals being all that dissimilar for different reasons. I don't think they're all that dissimilar. So you, you validated some of my early thinking on kind of how we're how the enterprise is interpreting so- it. We don't have as many 5G conversations, and I'll be yeah. honest, I think that's partially on us because we are not bringing them to from the client. I think yeah. we you will see us be doing that you know, sooner rather than later. The but conversations you know the, yeah. we are having, though, is on data yeah. and the yeah. amount of data and data movement and where data needs to go and how you yeah. monetize data. Uh, and, and, and you can't do that stuff without having a network conversation at the scale that, 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 that we need to be. And so I think it's coming from the data side and hasn't hit the network. And we're going to have this you know, collision at some point that goes, what if I could, all the things I need to do with data, how do I move that stuff a whole lot faster than I can do today? Um, and and I think a- we're having lots of data conversations without understanding what the edge and the network means as, as, a, as a part of that yet. Yeah, that's this that's the sneaky thing about 5G because people want to label it and such, but it's really not. It's really a confluence of connectivity, data, computing on the edge, sure. automation. Yep. It's just it's it's sort of masqueraded as something else. But you are having those conversations. Now when you say, hey Mr. and Mrs. Customer, we can enable all these use cases, let's build you a network that can actually perform in that way, then the conversations change pretty dramatic. Dr- yeah. dramatic. Hey, Jim, this yeah. is Kerr. Just one comment on, to that point about data that I heavily align with is even as I think about things like IoT, IoT fundamentally to me is are just new ways to acquire data in places that we've not been able to acquire data in the past, right? Because of the, the proliferation of sensor technologies being deployed in lots of different things. And it all leads back to it's just much more data that's being collected that we have to figure out how to create intelligence from. Yeah. yeah, well, I'll, I mean, I'll add, and right, our view of the world comes very much from a Microsoft perspective. You know, we, we, we can have lots of debates, but I will I, I will argue that right now Microsoft is leading in some of the things they're doing on the digital twin and data visualization and graph database side across some of the other providers, specifically, you know, Amazon. Um, I think there's also a, a lack of understanding of what it means to process true real-time data and how you bring that in to an organization from the data pipelines and, 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 and bring that visualization. And no one's really figured out the secret sauce to you know, the solutions that sort of bring that at, at the value that an enterprise is, is looking for. Um, and I, I think that's sort of the, we're on the cusp of that wave as well. Whereas there is the, all right, I'll look at my report, I'll have the analytics, I'll understand what that looks like. But I'm in conversations with clients around we, you know, they've always used the term real term data, real time data, but like we could actually do real time data now. Yeah. Um, and and, and real, what real is time that and mean? visualization are key and right? real so, time visualization. Yeah, so we we have some startups that are interesting in the in that space. Yep. <laughs> well, no, and we that's sure why do. we're here, right? So yeah, excellent. Well, 
I know we're about time here, so I'll, I'll probably stop here and thank you all for, uh, Craig, thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, we really enjoy hearing from your perspective. It really helps to kind of bring a lot of our tech talk into real terms as it relates to customer engagements that Avnod's engaged in. Jamal, thank you for sharing your 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 thoughts on the process and Aaron, obviously, for being a, a big supporter of us. Um, and so with that, I think it's probably about time for us to, to wrap up today. So thank you again, guys, for your time. Um, have a thank great you. rest of your day, and we look forward to staying in touch. Big things in, in progress. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Thank you, guys. Cheers.